With another college baseball season officially in the book, South Carolina has already seen several changes since their season ended a couple weeks ago. And to talk about some of those changes and to look ahead at perhaps what is next for USC is Colin Taylor. And Colin, it is amazing to see how much has changed in what feels like such a small period of time since the Gamecock season wrapped up in Gainesville and Supers. We'll start with the coaching staff. It's been a couple changes, and there could be another one coming up in the next couple days. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the new normal in college baseball now where you're seeing staff changes um, pretty rapidly and move fairly quickly for a lot of reasons. Um, so Justin Parker takes the job at Mississippi State. It become He takes it, I want to say, Sunday night, and by Monday morning, Mark Kingston has his replacement. Um so Justin Parker leaves to go to Mississippi State. Uh, they are bringing in uh, Matt Williams from Liberty. Strong track record there. And then all signs point to uh, Joey Holcomb joining the staff as well, over, coming over from Campbell um, after spending a pair of years there uh, to fill that third assistant spot that takes effect uh, July 1st. So uh, a lot of changes, uh, two really entrenched and, and seasoned uh, assistant coaches who have a really strong reputation in the college baseball community. So two very, very high level additions, and we'll see how they kind of mesh together with Mark Kingston and Monty Lee, the two holdovers from last season. Let's go back for a second though, with Matt Williams, because I know you and I were talking about this when everything was taking place about a week ago. I've heard nothing but good things about Williams. And I understand the frustration when you lose a coach especially one that goes within the conference, right? And it's not seen as an upgraded position. It's kind of a lateral move. Obviously, money plays a big role with that. But at the same time, too, and this is no disrespect to talking about Parker, but it also lets you know how they feel about Williams, that they feel like, hey, all right, Mississippi State's coming in, taking one of our guys. But at the same time, too, we feel like we have a good one ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Kendall Rogers of D1 Baseball tweeted it. He said with – with Parker going to Mississippi State and, and South Carolina getting Matt Williams, it, it it feels like both sides come away from this pretty happy. And I, I think that's fair to to say, obviously, South Carolina. Parker did a very good job with the Gamecocks, but Matt Williams is someone that was very, very heavily courted in 2021 to fill that open position for pitching coach that ultimately went to Parker. So he's been on South Carolina's radar for a while. Now was the right time uh, for him career-wise, to take this and, and come over from Liberty. And a very, very big rising star in this. He has built a lot of really good staff, dating back to his time um, in JUCO at Spartanburg Methodist to UNCW to uh, now Liberty. And, and he's those pitching staffs were a big reason why they met South Carolina twice in regional finals in 16 mm -hmm. and in 18. So, um a really, really, really good addition for South Carolina. And uh, we'll be interested to see once all of his contract details come out, what that looks like as you um, look forward and see what, what they're willing to commit money wise and salary wise to him. And I'll say this, and I'm just relaying what I was told. Two different players reached out to me, two former players reached out to me and they said, if Williams was on the coaching staff in 2021, they felt like they would have been an Omaha team. Now, again, obviously there were certain struggles that happened at the plate, but that just lets you know how some of these guys feel about Williams because of his connections to not just the university, but to the state as a whole. And some of these guys had an opportunity to work with them in the past. So just to throw that out there. As far as the transfer portal goes, we'll start with one of the departures because things happen, right? Guys are going to leave. Guys are going to come um, into the program. I mean, that's just the new norm. LSU, they showed that uh, certainly over the weekend. But with Michael Braswell on the way out, I think maybe because of how quick it happened, Colin, maybe that's what frustrated some people. But as you said many times before, even leading up to that point, and maybe it was not Braswell by name, but specifically talking about what South Carolina's plans were as far as recruiting in the transfer portal, positions up the middle, shortstop, second base, that USC was going to be heavily involved this offseason. With all that being said, were you surprised at all by the Braswell announcement? No, I was not. Um, 
South Carolina was is was and is going to recruit middle infielders. Um, they're still very heavily involved in the middle infielder game right now in the portal, and there wasn't a guarantee that Michael Braswell would have started at shortstop for South mm-hmm. Carolina next year. And uh, South Carolina is very confident in the abilities of Will Tippett. Um, they have a signee coming in in, in Lee Ellis, who's a shortstop. So uh, not to say they won't continue to kick the tires on some potential – um, shortstops in the transfer portal. Uh, but those are two guys that you look at right now. And if you're South Carolina, there wasn't a guarantee to Michael Braswell that he would be able to, to be the short starting shortstop favorite going into the fall and then the spring. So looking f- for a place that he could potentially have that. And uh, I don't know if he'll start at short at LSU, but he opted to go there and uh, we'll see what, what he can do. Um, for now, what is the the reigning national champions? And I know that this is just the beginning when you're looking at baseball and the transfer portal in comparison to some other sports because it's a spring sport. So obviously the timeline's a little bit different. Do you expect any other changes over the next couple of weeks, perhaps, from the portal in terms of players potentially leaving? We've seen cryptic tweets from some players and posts on social media. Do you expect anything? Not at this moment. Um, You never say never because things can change and shift and whatnot, depending on what the portal class looks like. But I'm not anticipating anything portal exiting right now. And um, if it is, I don't anticipate it being key, key, key contributors right now. Um, As we sit here, I got a timestamp because people always throw back on if that changes. But June 27th at 153, I do not anticipate anything major happening exit wise in the portal. So I'm just going to be very direct. Usually we talk about certain things. I'm going to ask it, but I, I feel like I, I have to be direct. And I know you, you, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm trying to go with this. When we talk about cryptic tweets, does that include Costas, at least as of now? Yeah. If I'm penciling in a roster for next year, Gavin Costas is on that roster. So I, I, I think he'll be back at South Carolina, barring anything unforeseen changing over the course of the next few weeks. We haven't even talked about it. any idea where that tweet came from. Was he just happy? That's a oh, really that's a that's a really good question. I don't know. Um, I haven't done any digging on it myself. I didn't know if perhaps you did. No, that that's a an interesting one. But right now, I'm thinking Gavin's going to be back in South Carolina next year. All right. So for anyone that was like, "All right, hey, why didn't he ask him directly?" There you go. That's for you, you at home watching. There you go. All right, moving things along. Transfer portal. You mentioned it a little bit with with Braswell, right? With him leaving and just the job South Carolina is doing right now. Uh, I think you'd be naive not to believe, especially after the success they've had last year. And again, talking about LSU, talking about some of these other teams throughout college baseball, the success they've had with recruiting when it comes to the portal. Weird to South Carolina stand right now. I know there's been a couple additions and we can talk about those guys to start off with because they're not wasting any time as far as attacking a portal for this offseason. No, and, and they did a, they've done a very, very, very good job in the portal so far. Uh, still have a few needs they need answered. And then that big fish out there in, in Billy Amick, obviously, who's who's one of the primary targets for South Carolina in the portal. Um, but you're looking at Austin Brindling, who had an on-base percentage of 500 at North Florida last year, uh, played really well against high major competition. Um, you have Dalton Reeves, you have Blake Jackson, uh, utility and then a catcher or utility in, in Reeves and then uh, an outfielder in Blake Jackson who had a came on strong late for Charlotte. Uh, the biggest name that they've added in this class so far is Kennedy Jones, Adam mm-hmm. UNC Greensboro, um, hit over 350 last season, hit 14 bombs, 14 doubles, um, had one fewer RBI than strikeout, 43 RBIs and 44 strikeouts. So a really, 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 really talented piece to, to add to the mix. And uh, for South Carolina, you had to retool the top of your lineup a little bit. When you talk about um, losing Will McGillis, losing Braylon Wimmer, you needed to restock the top. And you did that with Brindling and Jones. And you could potentially have a top four in your lineup that is Austin Brindling, Kennedy Jones, Ethan Petrie, and Cole Messina. And then if you add Billy Amick, maybe Billy Amick fifth. Um, you're talking about a, a really, really talented top ha- top half of the order, and then you throw in a Gavin Casas, and 
you throw in all these other pieces that they have at Talmadge Lee Croy, it, it makes things very, very interesting. And um, that's that on the, the hitting side. And then on the pitching side, you've had Garrett Ganey from Liberty, um, left-hander that can add some depth and, and potentially compete for some innings. Uh, Tyler Dean, who is coming from Virginia Tech, a former top 100 prospect coming out of high school. Never really could find it at Tech, but has a live fastball, could be a, a key reliever for them. And then reigning CAA Pitcher of the Year, Ty Good. Uh, mm-hmm. South Carolina was his dream school. He picked them. Uh, was the, again, Conference Pitcher of the Year with almost 100 strikeouts and uh, a really, really talented pitcher. So there's a lot of really good pieces. They're not done by any stretch moving forward, but that's the class right now, and, and it's a pretty solid one as you kind of project ahead to what they can be next season and, and what they might potentially add. And I know the college sport purists out there, they don't like hearing anything about NIL, but it's it's the reality of the world that we're living in right now. And there's certain things that you can't control, and it's tough to even guess sometimes because things can pop up, right, that you have no idea about at one school or another, and that could certainly change things. So I say all that, and I don't want to specifically say that about Amick because I don't know exactly what, it will come down to for him, but obviously there's been multiple reports out there that Florida is heavily in the mix. You would assume NIL would be something that the Gators would try to pony up to be able to bring a player in like that. With that all being said and the factors that you can't control, again, can't control the NIL stuff um, for the most part. Where does South Carolina stand, you feel like, in terms of being able to get him in terms of what they can control? Yeah, I think that they can – really sell what they want to sell, what he wants to hear. Um, Wants to play third base. I think South Carolina can give him that position and not give him that position, but allow him to compete for the starting third base job. Uh, He's got a chance to stay close to home. Um, Obviously a South Carolina kid. There's a lot to sell there. Obviously the connection with Monty Lee. Uh, Monty Lee was the head coach at Clemson when Amy committed and was there for a year before, obviously, um, everything that happened. So if you're talking about that, there's a lot to sell uh, relationship wise, being close to home wise. And let's not be naive here. If, if Amit comes to Columbia and commits to South Carolina, he's going to have plenty of chances to earn name, image, and likeness money to go along with it. That's not, it's not like he's going to come to Columbia if he does and, and not make any money. Uh, a lot of other SEC schools are showing interest in him. Um, again, Florida, you have, a&M, you have Tennessee, you have a couple others. I mean, those are – there's some really talented programs also showing um, interest in him. So it'll be really interesting to see how that recruitment kind of shapes up. But it's not – I don't think it'll linger too long. But South Carolina has a good bit to sell to him in terms of being able to compete for that starting third base job mm-hmm. and then uh, really have a chance to make some money uh, because other guys have to and, and be close to home to do it. Yeah, and just that relationship, too, with Monty Lee. I mean, obviously it's one that doesn't hurt the Gamecocks. And yeah. having a couple of Clemson players come on over could also be another selling point. Obviously those guys didn't get to play with Amick because Amick was a freshman, but still you get you get the point of comparing the two schools and everything different that, you know, college kids could talk about from, you know, what's like over here at Team A compared to Team B. Last thing I want to ask you, Colin, been rumbles about – an extension on the horizon for Mark Kingston. I know that we don't know the exact specifics. I know you've been following along with that, along with everything else that you have to do with GC, but where are they at with that? And if you had to take a guess, what would this ultimately mean? Because I think there's some people out there who are very obviously excited about what Kingston was able to do. Certainly he changed his approach this year and it worked tremendously. Um, And you hope that that success can be sustained moving forward. But I'm sure there's going to be some people out there that are like, wait a minute. All right. You know, slow down a little bit. Where do you see everything right now with that? Yeah. So Ray Tanner told us the other week at a board meeting that they are, he's talked with Kingston's representatives is the Kingston camp about potential a reworked contract and, and all of that um, has not talked to coach Kingston yet. I don't believe, but um, I believe that's, that's coming down the pipe. 
if that makes sense. And mm-hmm. right now, Mark Kingston only has two years left on his deal and is making about $600,000 a year, which um, is is near the bottom in terms of head coaching salaries in the SEC. So I would anticipate him getting somewhat of a pay bump, uh, maybe to put him towards the middle of the pack in the, in the league. And then my guess would be at least a two-year extension just to, for recruiting for every coach no loves to have every coach who loves to have that four year minimum deal to it. So um, bumping back up to, to a four year deal through, I guess that would be 2027 uh, and then give him a raise after having this level of season and then get him towards the middle of the pack salary wise um, for Mark Kingston, but details on that still TBD and, and what a time frame looks like. We're not sure yet from, from Ray Tanner and Mark Kingston. Yeah, you nailed it right in the head. I mean, those are the two big things. First, like you said, financially, when you compare his salary up against the rest of the SEC, I mean, shoot, Georgia just hired a coach who, correct me if I'm wrong, he's never been a head coach before. And Kingston is getting paid less than him. And everyone wants to, you know, pound their chest, say, oh, this is South Carolina baseball, the great history, and X, Y, Z. You're paying your coach who's been here for, you know, more than half a decade what he's getting paid certainly deserves more. Number one, but number two, like you said, from a recruiting standpoint, regardless of your feelings of Kingston, let's say you say, all right, hey, I'm not sold on him yet. You know, I get that. Okay, that's fine. But at the same time, too, all you're doing is hurting yourself and your program because another coach can go out there and be like, see, they're not giving this guy extra years. He might not even be there in more than two years. You don't think that happens in baseball, happens in basketball. Go ask Frank Martin about it. Right? We had to go through that a couple of years back. So good stuff, Colin. He's Colin Taylor. Be sure to follow all summer long. Obviously, there's a lot going on right now over on GC. There's plenty of specials to take advantage of, too. I mean, recruiting's picking up. If you didn't see the story with Dante Reno on Monday, Reno said, buckle up, because July's going to be a big month. So, big month for football on the horizon, but for baseball, it seems like that is not going to slow down. No. And maybe we'll see some basketball updates as well along the way, because... Lamont Paris looks like they are in a much better spot right now in comparison to where they were in year one. Absolutely.